does Sonoma County, California, have more soil types than all of France? And how does that affect the wine you drink? How does fog play a profound role in the growing of grapes and making of wine in this region, especially in the Russian River Valley? And why are traditional Eurocentric food and wine pairings, uh, those rules, why are they somewhat outdated now? Well, tonight you're going to get those stories and tips that answer those questions. If you're watching this video on the replay, please get into the comments and type the word replay. Let me know where you're logging in from, what's in your glass. And of course, if you're here on the live stream, I want to know where you are, um, what you're enjoying, what the weather's like, anything you like. I'm Natalie McLean and I teach popular online food and wine pairing classes and you've just joined one of the most passionate groups of wine lovers who gather every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern on Facebook Live and YouTube to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine, like our guest whom I'll introduce momentarily. Now I'm live streaming this for the first time on social media, uh, but it's based on a recorded conversation I had with our guest uh, for my podcast, Unreserved Wine Talk. I'll be jumping into the comments though. I'm here live in the comments as we watch it together so that I can be more active in answering your questions. And I really do wanna hear from you. What tips and stories are you enjoying? Um, what tip, takeaways or tips do you uh, love most? What questions do you have that we haven't answered? Now, before I introduce our guest, I just want to say that, th uh, that one of you is going to win a bottle of her amazing, really amazing Pinot Noir from the Russian River Valley. Uh, all you have to do is email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com and tell me that you'd like to win a bottle. I'll choose one person randomly from those who contact me. All right, back to our guest. Teresa Heredia has earned a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from California Polytechnic State University, Cal Poly, at St. Louis Obispo, and was a PhD candidate in chemistry with an emphasis on enology at the University of California at Davis, UC Davis, before leaving to pursue her passion to become a winemaker. She has worked for some of California's most prestigious wineries, including Sainsbury, a uh, winery in Napa Valley, Joseph Phelps Vineyards, and Freestone Vineyards and Winery, as well as Domaine de la Monti in Burgundy, France. She joined Gary Farrell Winery and Vineyards in 2012 and achieved critical acclaim for her wines from leading publications such as the San Francisco Chronicle, The Wine Spectator, and The Wine Enthusiast magazines, as well as being nominated twice for Winemaker of the Year. And she joins us now from her home in Sonoma, Teresa, it's so great to have you here with us. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Natalie. It's an honor to be here and a privilege. My pleasure. All right. Well, you know, let's start with the, the very beginning. You had an early love of chemistry. Where did that come from? Um, and do you remember any, any early experiments? Um, I mean, I know exactly where my love of chemistry came from, um, two, twofold, really. Uh, when I was a kid and, you know, we had summers at home and we were latchkey kids. So, you know, my mom was working all day and my dad was living separately and we'd get home from school and often I would, you know, I would want to play around with things in the kitchen, not cooking, but just like mix some stuff together to see what happens. And, um, you know, like baking soda was always fun to play with. So... <laughs> That can, so, uh, can cause, is that the one that causes it, can it cause it can, it okay. can indeed, yeah. So um, anyway, so that's, that's one part of the story. And then when I got into high school science classes, I, I found that I loved biology. I had a really fantastic teacher, but when I got to chemistry, I just, you know, I excelled in it, did really well. Um, my brother and his best friend used to ask me for help in chemistry. So um, I realized it was kind of a natural thing for me. And so that's what really led me to pursue a degree in, in biochem and then chemistry. That's wonderful. And you even remember a particular teacher, I believe? Yes. Um, my chemistry teacher in high school was Mr. Jang. And um, his wife actually was my third grade elementary school teacher. So oh, it's wow. funny. I actually emailed him or no, did I email him or call him? I think I emailed him back in like 2011 or something just to say, you know, I want you to know how much you know your your influence on me has affected my career. Wow, that's great. Has he ever tasted your wines? I don't know. Haven't reached out to him again. I should. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, as I understand uh, from my research, your parents weren't wine connoisseurs, though they did enjoy their boxed wine in the fridge. 
Uh, you carried on that tradition in college with your own boxes of Boone's Strawberry Hill wine. Uh, we will <laughs> not be analyzing that one today. No. Nope. Um, <laughs> what happened to you and a friend when you were out enjoying an adult beverage on some floaty rafts back in those days? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> we're talking Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill sweet wine, right? It's like sweet fortified wine. And we were camping at Lake Havasu in Arizona and um, it was just uh, a really windy day. And I think a monsoon came in and we were on our two little floaty rafts. Each of us had a, a you know, a little cup holder, some Boone's Farm in the cup holder. And we got uh, blown out there and the Coast Guard had to come on its raft and, you know, <laughs> wow. and pick us up. So we weren't that far out there, but it was far enough that our little floaty rafts that we're trying to paddle with our hands wasn't good enough. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's extreme wine tasting. So that's extreme. <laughs> an early taste of that. Yeah. Now, you were still pursuing your PhD in chemistry when you and your partner traveled through Burgundy, Bordeaux, and the Rhone Valley in France. Tell us about your experience at the renowned restaurant Ma Cuisine in Bone Burgundy. I've been there too, and it's amazing. Oh, it's yeah. so casual, yet the food is mind-blowing, but tell us what happened yeah. to you. So we were there. Um, we had just, you know, arrived on our trip, and we knew that we wanted to go to Ma Cuisine, and um, we had a bottle of, I, I would say that that was one of my aha moments in my, you know, discovering my wine career. And we were there, so we had a bottle of 19, I think it was a 1995 Denny Morte Clos de Vougeot. Mm -hmm. And it just blew my mind because I had consumed some lower end burgundies in California, but they're a lot more expensive here. And, you know, to, to buy them is just, to, to get the high end ones is not affordable, especially for graduate students. So um, we had this delicious bottle and I realized there are some really amazing vineyards and wines in the world that are really truly expressive of place. And I just came home wanting to, to make wines that are expressive of place. Wow, that's quite the journey from Boone's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you developed a taste for both Pinot Noir, elegant, light bodied, usually light to medium, and Chardonnay mm -hmm. de Pop, which is fairly robust, blend mm -hmm. from the Rhone Valley. Uh, those red wine styles are almost diametrically opposed in terms of body, taste, and weight. Um, many people prefer one style or the or the other. Why? Why did you? Or why do you think you developed a taste for both? So truthfully, um, depending on the style of Chateau Neuf de Pop that you love, um, I love the ones that are more expressive of the Grenache grape varietal. And those tend to be more red fruit driven, a little bit lighter in structure and body, um, still bigger than a lot of Pinot Noirs. But I think I love them because they are, you know, similar in body. It's like a step up from Pinot Noir to Grenache, right? That's true. And so Chateau Neuf de Pop has a lot of different grape varietals in it. But, you know, the ones that taste like they're a little bit more Grenache forward are the style that I prefer. I love that. I would have never yeah. figured that one out. Because, um, yeah, Grenache is so elegant, so smooth, yeah. and so lovely, even on its own. Mm -hmm. But I can see that. The yeah. ones that are more Syrah heavy are going to be that deeper, darker, bigger, robust wines that you're talking about. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what was the exact moment you realized you wanted to become a winemaker, or at least go into the wine field? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a funny story. So. I was in grad school at UC Davis and there are 400 undergraduate students in a general chemistry class. So remember that at the time I was studying chemistry, I was working on my PhD and just really had, you know, started finishing the coursework and working on my research project. And so um, there were other graduate student teaching assistants as well. Um, there were 12 of us in total. So we would get together to grade exams and we all came from different departments. So some of us came from chemistry, some from biochem, microbiology, viticulture and enology. So each of us kind of went around the room talking about our research projects and um, analysis that we're doing. And I realized, I heard these viticulture and enology students talking about their research and they brought wine to the grading session as well. So how fun, right? And when they started talking about their research, I realized that we're doing the same thing. It's the same type of analysis, statistical analysis, analytical instrumentation. It was all pretty much the same thing. So I realized really quickly that I could um, enjoy, you know, the passionate parts of wine consumption and learning, but also the science part could be applied as well. And so I switched within days. 
to the oh. enology program and never looked back. And then very soon after I got hired on full time at Joseph Phelps Vineyards as the research chemist. And so that was just the perfect marriage for me, you know, that to, to start there. It was per Absolutely. it was like the stars had aligned. Yes, chemistry, but more fun with wine. Yes, <laughs> and you're still sort of chem geeky, but you know, absolutely. So. <laughs> um, and in addition to to wine, adding a, a, a more of a sensual, fun element, you're also drawn to it um, for another reason. Um, you talk about, or you've talked about in the past, seeing the results in your in your lifetime. Maybe expand on that a little bit. Yeah. So, well, with peptide research, peptide synthesis that I was doing in grad school. Um, Are those short proteins or something like this? I yeah, it's guess, like a yeah. short, it's it's not a protein because a protein's okay. a longer chain, but a peptide wow. is a short chain of amino acids, a protein's a long chain of amino acids. Okay. And so um, I was, you know, synthetically building, chemically building a library of peptides um, looking for, uh, actually, I don't want to get into that because that's a whole yeah, video not, unto itself. I itself. dropped chemistry at 11, sorry. <laughs> We do have lots in common, but not that. <laughs> but okay. it was cancer, cancer therapeutics research wow. is what I was doing. And um, yeah, it was really fascinating, but I was, I was kind of ground zero in terms of that project. And so I didn't feel like I was ever going to see the results of that project in my lifetime. And when I realized I could do science in wine, you know, wine is, um, what, about... 10 months to a year, maybe 18 months of, you know, really the time from grape to bottle and for Pinot Noir. And um, I just felt like it was not quite instant gratification, but almost. During harvest, it feels like instant gratification because you put the grapes in the tank, you taste the juice the next day, and immediately you start to see the evolution from the fruit on the vine to juice in the tank and the flavors start developing into wine during fermentation and afterwards. So I just love it. I, I love every step. Harvest is like one of my favorite times of year. Oh, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, now, take us to the worst moment of your wine making career. Maybe it was a really challenging vintage or and, and what did you learn from that? Yeah, um, there are a number of different um, times. I mean, 2020 was a really tough year, but um, everybody knows about that, tough? so that's boring. 2020. 2020 was tough because of the fires. Um, nice. You know, it was um, just widespread all over Sonoma and Napa counties. But everybody's heard about that. Everybody knows about that. So um, going back to my time at Joseph Phelps Freestone Vineyards, it was my um, my third full time harvest in the winery in the new Freestone Winery that had been built in 2007. We made wine before that from 2002 forward, but um, I'm talking about in the, the winery facility. So we're there and 2010 was just a, a long, cool growing season up until August. And then again in September, we got two separate heat waves. So the first heat wave in August um, caused some desiccation of the grapes, but and out in Freestone, mean, desiccation? like raisining, drying okay. of gotcha. the grapes. Yeah. But out at Freestone, harvest doesn't really start. The grapes aren't really ready until, or at the time, they weren't really ready until the end of September, early October. So you can think of it in terms of that heat wave hit, and we were still like a month away from harvest. But there was another heat wave that came in September. Um, and we knew a heat wave was coming, and they were forecasting mid-90s, you know, out on the coast, which is kind of odd, or was odd at the time. Um, and it had been a really cold, wet, foggy summer, so... Um, the poor grapes hadn't really seen that much sunshine or heat. And so they just like the exposed side of the clusters just fried in the sun. And so you had beautiful clusters and ripe stems on one side and then raisins on the other side. So, oh. yeah, so it was a tough year to, to remedy it. The best that we could do is um, I decided to do a, re a reverse sort. It's what I call a reverse sort. Usually you put the clusters across the sorting table and you pull out the bad stuff, like a raisin here and there, you know, maybe a moldy cluster. Well, in this case, we were pulling out the beautiful gems, what I call the, the nuggets of love. <laughs> oh. So oh. we pulled them out and we use those for whole cluster inclusion in the fermentation. Okay. And we're going to talk about that um, yeah. later on. Now take us to the, the best moment of your career. I love a happy ending um, so far because you've got a long career ahead of you, but what's been the most best moment so far? Um, I've had a lot, I've had a lot. Um, one that comes to mind, um, kind of a fun one that comes to mind is in 2020, when we're all sitting home bored, um, you know, trying to figure out what to do, 
we came, we the, at Gary Farrell Winery came across this video on YouTube that Zoe Bell posted, and it was called the um, God. What was it called? Was I think it was Zoe called Bell, the, by the way, uh, a famous actress, I believe. Okay. Um, and and she posted this video. I think it was called the Boss Bitch Fight Challenge, <laughs> and so it was all on video, right? And so it was just camera work, tricks of of the camera, and so. There were a bunch of famous women like Cameron Diaz, Rosie Perez, um, Florence Pugh. And so each of them was like either throwing an, an item and then, you know, they would each record it, right? And so the person who put the video together made it look like the person was throwing it before and it hit the person who's next on video. And it went on. I think there were at least like 10 or 20 different women. And Florence Pugh when you get to her, you see her like, you know, scratching her head like, ow, that hurt. And then she goes to look around to grab something and she grabs a bottle of Gary Farrell wine and oh, she's about absolutely. to hit somebody with it. But then she looks at it and she's like, and then she puts it down and she grabs a dog bone instead. <laughs> Smart. So it was really cool. It was really cool to see that. That is great. Well, excellent virality. Um, yeah. All right. So in 2001, you, as you've mentioned, you've done, you did your first harvest with Sainsbury and Carneros, which sits between Napa and Kenoma, uh, Sonoma. Um, the next year, you were hired full time at Joseph Phelps Vineyards, where you spent 10 years making Freestone and Fog Dog wines mm -hmm. from a new vineyard. Why was that such a good experience for a new experimental winemaker, as you describe yourself? It was amazing. It was like um, it was like I had been invited to the University of you know, cool climate, Sonoma Coast, Pinot and Chardonnay winemaking. And I really had very little experience at the time. And so I was working in collaboration with the director of winemaking at the time. His name is Craig Williams. And he was very experimental. He knew I was. And so we were just like two kids in a candy store, you know, just trying different experiments with Pinot to see what makes the best, most site specific wines from the Sonoma Coast. And I just had so much fun, and I feel like it was a really unique opportunity for a young winemaker to learn in the deep, to really jump in the deep end of winemaking and, and learn. We had no, there was no brand established, there was no winemaking protocol established, so it was all, it was all game. Yeah, wow, that, that is great. What a great experience. It was tremendous. One, because you also had the mentor too, you weren't left on your own flying Correct. alone. Mm -hmm. uh, that is great. I'm going to ask you a few questions about what happens as you make wine now, um, because I'm yeah. just really interested. How many times do you taste grapes as they ripen? You're out in the vineyard, like, is it every day or, I mean, how often? Yeah, every day, every, every day, day during the harvest. As soon as the grapes um, start to turn purple, the right. Pinot Noir grapes we're talking about since you're tasting Pinot today and so am I. Sure. Um, so as soon as the grapes start to turn purple, um, they start to you know, lose some of the, the really harsh malic acid and they start to develop sugar. And um, as they do, they become more edible. And so, you know, the humans are eating them, the birds are eating them, other critters out there are trying to eat them as well, like deer, we try to keep them out of the vineyard. But I'm out there every day trying to see um, each of the vineyards and the blocks within each of the vineyards um, at least a couple of times a week. That way I can get a um, kind of, I'm a scientist, so I can, my palate can sort of calibrate and develop a um, kind of a curve, so to speak, to see you how it's changing over your time. your own bricks meter. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a technical tool. Do you also use one of those in addition? Like Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. So I have one of the old fashioned ones, a refractometer, where you put oh. a little drop in and then you, you shine it up to the light and then you oh. can, you, there's a little, um, a little graph in there that you can see the, the bricks level. Is there a reason why you use the old-fashioned one versus whatever the newfangled contraption is these days? I use the newfangled one at in lab at the winery, um, oh. and I use the old-school refractometer when I'm out in the vineyard because I don't have to worry about destroying it. The other one is digital. <laughs> the one I'm talking about is is just a, a an old-school mechanical one. Right. Okay. Sounds like a kaleidoscope or something. <laughs> it kind of yeah, kind of. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And how many times do you taste the wine as it's aging in the barrel once you get it in? as much as possible. However, I have to respect the fact that um, we're trying to keep things, um, we're trying to be as sanitary as possible. So we don't want to in introduce, you know, bacteria and stuff like that into the wines and then have the wines, you know, develop volatile acidity or any other issues. Um, but during harvest in the fermenter, I taste 
multiple times throughout the day, at least two, if not three times throughout the day. Wow. Does that yeah. ever get, does your mouth ever get really sore or tired from all the acidity or the tannin, all of that? It gets tired, yeah. And so that's why bubbles are such a great thing. You yeah. know, we start out the harvest with bubbles and, you oh. know, we kind of finish the day either with a glass of champagne or sparkling wine, um, like an iron horse or something local, um, or a, a really crisp, refreshing beer. Ah, so you toast at the beginning of the harvest as well, like a little ritual to mm -hmm. get you started. We do. It's it's part of the, um, we call it the, um, just the toast to ring in the new harvest. Huh. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's kind of a blessing, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And do you still use the um, mobile app called When Wine Tastes that, uh, Best? That is a, I sure do. I okay. It's a biodynamic calendar for when yeah. wine drinkers, for wine drinkers, well, I guess it was made for wine drinkers. Uh, indicating the best days to open and drink the wine, I think, based on the moon cycle. Um, but you use it as well for when, do you use it like for when to pick the grapes or how do you use it? Mostly it's just a fun little casual app that I use, um, you know, just to see how, how the wine might be showing today. And I usually don't look at it preemptively. I usually um, look at it after the fact because if mm. I'm smelling or tasting the wine um, and it, it seems a little bit more earthy, today or maybe you know it doesn't seem like the aromas are as lifted as they were the last time I tasted it I might open the app just to see hey is it a root day or a leaf day is that why I'm smelling more earthy you know maybe herbaceous aromas or am I smelling really lifted fruit aromas lots of vibrant cherry and raspberry in that case maybe it's a fruit day sometimes it correlates sometimes it doesn't huh and so by fruit day is it are they defining that is this the calendar and biodynamics by extension, defining that based on the gravitational moon, pull of the moon in terms mm -hmm. of how, how, how does that work once the wine is in the bottle? The moon is, um, maybe you can help me understand yeah, what's yeah. going on there. I'll try, I'll try, I'll do my yeah. best without okay. getting into a dissertation. Um, <laughs> so also because that's not my area of expertise. However, <laughs> I do know that the, um, the lunar cycle um, is you know correlated to gravitational forces. So on different days, um, the gravitational forces are really strong. So let's start by talking about um, why we would harvest based on the biodynamic calendar and the gravitational forces. So on a root day, the vines are, the, all of the fruity esters and aromatic you know, compounds are being pulled down into the vine. And so if you pick on a root day, the theory is that you're not gonna capture as much of the aromatic you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then on a, um, let's see, that's a root day. So next would be a leaf day. Um, on a leaf day, you might capture more of the leafy, you know, vegetal aromas. On a, um, the next is a flower day. You might capture a lot of the floral aromatics. And on a fruit day, the gravitational forces are the weakest or not as strong. And so you're gonna capture all of that stuff, everything, um, all the fruity floral stuff and, and everything down below that as well. So it, um, you can talk about that with respect to wine in the bottle as well. If you're drinking it on a root day, all those, you know, aromatics and stuff are just going to not, they're going to be pulled more into the liquid, right? And so they may not smell as, as fruity and floral as they would if you were drinking them on a, a fruit or a flower day. Fascinating. Wow. How yeah. Look up that app. It's um, fun. You should check it out. I, I also talk about it, like, you know how there are just some days and you can't explain it. You slept really well. However, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh my God, everything just feels heavy. You're having you know, a root like, day. Like yeah. it feels like a root day. And sometimes yeah. I open up the calendar and guess what? It's a root day. It's a root day. <laughs> yeah. That's what I can blame it on from now on. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just having a root day. Don't worry. Yep. <laughs> um, you're also a big audiophile. And in fact, you even have a restored analog turntable, which is super cool. Indeed. What uh, music do you like to play in the cellar as wine matures? And um, what do you play it on? Uh, so in 2021, um, I finally broke down and bought, uh, like, it's like a big boom box for the seller. Um, and I also bought a little portable JBL Extreme. It's like the, um, the big, you know, cylindrical speaker that has a shoulder strap on it. So huh. it's waterproof, so they can use it out on the crush pad. But in the cellar, um, we play music on the, the big boom box that sits up on top of the wall. And um, it's got great sound, lots of bass and everything, too. So... Truth be told, during harvest, um, there's a lot of hip hop um, ah. because I love it and it seems like, you know, the staff at the winery loves it too, the, the cellar staff. But 
um, our cellar master, Peter, and myself both really, really love jazz. And I'm a Blue Note jazz fan, and it seems that he is too. So oftentimes, you know, when the rest of the, the crew is gone and it's just Peter and myself, he'll put jazz on in the cellar, mostly for himself, but he knows that I enjoy it too. Is so. Blue Note a style of jazz? Or is it um, a record album like John Coltrane or... Coltrane only had one Blue Note. So Blue Note okay. was a jazz label. It was a jazz record label. Um, and, you know, the period of time that I really love is from 50s and early 60s. Okay. And, you know, like, um, oh my gosh, um, Herbie, I mean, uh, yeah, Herbie Hancock was on Blue Note, Hank Mobley, two of my favorites. Huh. And Coltrane's, um, God, what is it called? Um, I'm, for, I'm drawing a blank right now. But anyway, oh, that's okay. <laughs> one of his best albums that he did was on Blue Note, um, and it's called Blue Something. That's great. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, back to the winemaking. Uh, what are Jesus units? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus units. So um, this is, um, I learned about Jesus units during my first harvest when I was working at Saintsbury. And sometimes it's California, right? So the fruit might get a little bit riper than you want and um, develop more sugar than we would like. And as you know, most people know the sugar gets converted to alcohol. So if we don't want that much alcohol in the wine, we have to adjust it in some way. One tool of the trade is to add a little bit of water, right? It's like cooking or making jam, you know. And um, one way that you can measure the water addition is by attaching this little screw-on gauge. Um, it's a liquid gauge that goes on the end of a water hose. Okay. And it measures, you know, the amount of gallons that go into the tank. And so um, somebody actually changed it on the work order to say that each measure was a Jesus unit because you're literally <laughs> turning water into wine. <laughs> After the, the miracle of Cana, <laughs> when Jesus did yeah. that. Yep, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, and what's made of purple and what does it taste like? I have no idea what it tastes like, I'm proud to That's say. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> but I do know what it is. Um, okay. It's really, really concentrated grape juice. So it's just oh. grape, grape juice concentrate made from ruby red grapes, I believe. and um, ruby red grapes. grapes? Ruby red. I think, I think they're table grapes, but they have a. You don't really eat them. I don't think they oh. sell them in the store. But they have, um, you know, red purple skins, and they also have really red purple flesh. So imagine the amount of color that you can get. Right, right. And so, um, why do some people, some winemakers, add mega purple to wine? I mean, they're trying to add color and body and texture and, you know, just make bigger, bolder wines. Right. So it's yeah. kind of perhaps, depending on your viewpoint, an adulteration like using too much oak. For sure. Or too much sugar, shaptalizing or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. The yeah. Shaptalization, you know, in some cases is absolutely necessary and you can't really tell that it's there. Um, I don't think people are necessarily doing it doing it to make bigger, bolder wines. They're just doing it to correct something that happened to that particular harvest. But mega purple and mega red are, in my opinion, one of those, you know, adulterations that I'm just not a fan of. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah but some people might need it. Yeah, that's true. I guess yeah, yeah, to amp up the volume depending on what they're going for market-wise and exactly style-wise. But uh, I think they should call shaptalization reverse Jesus units. I think that would yeah. be easier to understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyway. exactly. Um, I'll have to think about a name for that. Yeah, um, RJU. Anyway, mm -hmm. you joined uh, Gary Farrell Vineyards and Winery in 2012, and the winery, uh, the winery that Gary Farrell himself founded in 1982 in the heart of Sonoma County, and he had been a handyman, if I understand correctly, at Davis Bynum Winery for a few years. The owner invited him to make a small batch of wine. His first wine won a silver medal at the Sonoma County Harvest Fair. What do you think was Gary's best or unique skill as a winemaker? Gary, I, believe it or not, I've never met him, but wow. I, I've heard so much about him over the years, um, and um, he was just a fastidious, fastidious winemaker. I think he is. Um, I've heard from people who knew him, know him really well, that um, he liked to wear white. In fact, um, somebody recently told me they used to call him the man in white. <laughs> and um, as a red winemaker, you know, wearing white is really brave, right? But right. that also goes to show that he's very fastidious and he, clean and he's not spilling on himself. And so that says a lot about his personality. And that really allowed him to make wines that are, you know, a really clean expression of the Russian River Valley or Sonoma Mountain, whatever wine he was making. Wow. 
I won't wear white to any sort of wine tasting. <laughs> I usually got black and still wine stained. Anyway, yeah. um, now the the um, the winery is perched, as I understand, high atop uh, a hilltop overlooking the stunning Russian River Valley. Tell us what we see from your tasting room and, and the terrace. It's a really beautiful view. Um, in fact, it's the view that it's what really told me that I had to accept the job at Gary Farrell. I, I went there to go do a tasting and I, I walked out and looked over the terrace and I was like, yes, I could, I could work here. I could spend a lot of time here. Um, so what you see, you, you looking over the terrace, you see the, the line of trees um, that are lining the Russian River itself. You can't see the river itself, but you can see the trees. And then you can also see on some days, if you're looking down in the morning, like during harvest, you can see the um, what looks like a, a Milky Way, um, a, you know, kind of a conveyor belt of milky white fog just moving along the river. It's really cool. Huh. And vineyards you see from the top of the terrace as well. Right. And are there other mountains that rise up sort of on either side of the river or, or are you sort of perched on the highest point and then it's sort of the valley spreads out below you? Yeah, it's the valley spreads out below. You can see some rolling hills and vineyards on the rolling hills, but um, mm. yeah, that's mostly what you see. Awesome. Um, sometimes, if I understand correctly, you hang out in the tasting room, uh, petting mm -hmm. the winery cat. I, I hope the cat is still with you. Is, is the cat still there? He is. His name's Benny. He's Benny. a great. I thought He's it was a great Chardonnay cat. or I don't know. <laughs> no. You know, paws or something. No. Uh, okay. Uh, Benny. I'll tell All you right. about his name. His name is Benny the Jet Rodriguez. And if anybody has seen The Sandlot, um, our former tasting room manager was a huge um, movie fan. And so he loved The Sandlot. And uh, Benny the Jet Rodriguez is the kid who runs really fast in the movie. Oh, gotcha. So, Great. Yeah. So this is Benny. <laughs> so what is the, the oddest or most amusing or whatever thing visitors have said, especially when they didn't realize at first that you, you make the wine? Um... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. They, yeah, I mean, just the mere fact that they didn't, some of them didn't realize that I was the winemaker and, you know, asked me, you know, where's the bathroom or, <laughs> you know, can I get a wine glass or, you, you know, up, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here, sure. hold my beer, <laughs> you know, cause I'm not, I'm not making myself, you know, a known either. And I'm just out there petting the cat. So yeah, <laughs> most of them just want to ask questions about the cat. <laughs> That's good. Um, so even though Gary Farrell, of course, is retired, he remains such a legendary figure in California winemaking. I know you've respected his tradition, but how did you find ways to step out of his shadow and make the wines your own? It's a really good question. Um, it was tough coming in to Gary Farrell. I felt like I had really big shoes to fill. Um, and, you know, what I've done is, what, what I did when I first came in is, um, I still, since I started in May of 2012, I had the opportunity to taste through all the wines in barrel, um, the ones that had not been blended yet. And that was the Pinots. The Chardonnays had already been blended to get ready for bottling. So I had each individual component of Pinot Noir to taste through, and um, it gave me the chance to compare and contrast vineyards, blocks within vineyards, different cooperages, so different barrel and toast types within each vineyard as well. And um, I went out to the vineyards, tasted as much as I could, and. I didn't come in immediately thinking that I could just use the techniques that I applied to making the wine at Freestone because we're in a different climate now. I'm in more inland in the Russian River Valley where it's a little bit warmer and um, Freestone is out near the coast. And so totally different fruit profiles and different tannin structure and everything. So I came in wanting to respect the fruit respect the existing wine making, respect the style, the historical style of Gary Farrell wines. And so I just kind of um, took it little by little and, you know, started evolving the wine making techniques a little at a time. So for example, um, I, I started buying some light toast barrels, but I bought maybe, you know, maybe 30 light toast barrels that year of our full order, which was, um, well, we probably ordered about 200 barrels. So, you know, a small experimental amount. Um, and I also introduced a little bit of whole cluster fermentation. We started talking about that already. Um, so on and so forth. I could tell you all kinds of winemaking techniques that I've, I've evolved over the years. There's a lot that you can change mm -hmm. in the winemaking practices 
and I've changed almost everything along the way, but the finished wine in the bottle is still consistent with the style that Gary was producing back in the day. Just, you know, different qualities, but similar. Does that How make sense? Describe, yeah, it does. Absolutely. How would you describe that signature style just overall, especially for, say, the Pinot Noir? Yeah. Um, so the, the Pinots that Gary used to make and the Pinots that I make are not only truly expressive of place, they have a lot of terroir, site specificity, whatever terminology you like to use. Um, they're also a little bit less ripe, so lower in alcohol. They've got really crisp, vibrant, fresh acidity, and they're made to pair with food. Hmm. My favorite type. All right. <laughs> um, and what makes the Russian River Valley, uh, which is an American viticultural appellation, or AVA, that was established in 1983, different from other AVAs or subregions in Sonoma, such as Carneros and Chalk Hill and Dry Creek Valley? Russian River Valley is um, very different um, from those in particular. Those are great examples. Um, I'll start with a comparison to Dry Creek. So Dry Creek is um, about, I mean, it's just a few miles north of us, no north of the northernmost tip of the Russian River Valley. Um, but Dry Creek is where you find Zinfandel, right? It's mostly known for Zinfandel. We grow a little bit of Zinfandel here in the Russian River Valley as well, but it's very different. So here in the Russian River Valley, um, for the most part, a lot of our vineyards are at slightly lower elevations. Um, a lot of them are right next to the river, like our Rocchioli Vineyard, for example, as well as our Bacigalupi Vineyard. And um, being adjacent to the river, that means that they have, you know, kind of gravelly riverbed soil. And also the Russian River is acting like a conveyor belt and pulling the fog in from the Pacific Ocean and chilling the grapes down at night to help capture um, natural acidity. So the vines really retain ample natural acidity, and that's a characteristic, defining characteristic of the wines. So do, does Dry Creek Valley not get the same amount of fog, or do they just really get very little fog at all? Like, is, is the fog a big difference? Big difference. So they do, I, I, they do get some fog, um, but for example, um, one of our Zinfandel vineyards that we've worked with in the past um, is in Dry Creek Valley, but up on Bradford Mountain. And so higher elevation, um, the fog might be present like in the early or overnight and in the wee hours of the morning. But for the most part, it's, you know, getting pulled from the ocean down below that elevation. And um, so that's what that, that's really what makes the biggest difference. But in Napa, um, Napa just doesn't get that that kind of fog presence at all because you have the Mayakamas Mountains in the way. And so it kind of is a, a block to the fog coming in from oh. the Pacific Ocean. Okay. A barrier, okay. so to speak. And so the fog um, you've talked about, it preserves, it cools the grapes down at night, so it's preserving the acidity. Are there any other impacts that fog has? Um, like, so you get these bursts of ripening in the day and then everything chills out at night. Um, what does that, does that lengthen the ripening season? Definitely. So um, we in Sonoma County, we like to talk about diurnal fluctuations. And so um, we're here in sunny California in the Russian River Valley, which is, as I said, inland from um, the Sonoma Coast, the, the far west Sonoma Coast, by about 20, 25, 30 minutes, depending on where you're driving from and to. Uh, and so the fog helps to chill things down at night, but it does get warm and sometimes hot during the day. So let's say it gets up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and at night, the grapes cool down to fog temperature, which is about 50, 55 degrees. So wow. you get that, that big swing in temperatures, and that's what we call a diurnal shift. Huh. And that's what, what really makes the complexity, that it's going full tilt in the day and then resting at night. Yep, and it's you know mostly about that acid retention, but also um, it, it helps with color development in the grapes as well. It kind of reminds me of like working out. So it's instead of just nothing changing, you know, you have intense workout and then you rest. And it's during yeah. that rest period, you know, you're repairing and then, anyway, I don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Metaphor or not, but. Um, it's a what? great one. Okay. It's, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> and you said the the river, is it the river mostly that draws the fog off as the day goes on? You know, the fog is burning off in the sun. Okay. Um, and the, the river is, you know, mechanically pulling it through, you know, from the Pacific Ocean into the valleys, the Russian River Valley. And then it just kind of burns off as the sunny day develops on throughout the day. Right, okay. 
So the winery produces about uh, 30 cases of wine a year, 60% sold in restaurants. We're fortunate in Canada to get a small number of those cases sold through retail outlets, mostly through the LCBL's Vintages Release Program. Um, but I'm curious, you work with about 35 to 40 different vineyards to produce mm -hmm. your seven vineyard designated Chardonnays, 14 vineyard designated Pinot Noirs each year, as well as a blend of grapes from various vineyards under your labels, the Russian River Valley Chardonnay and Pinot, which we're going to taste. It's very similar, I think, to the Burgundian model of being a negociant who purchases grapes from a lot of growers and then makes the wine rather than the Bordeaux model of a large estate owning their own grapes. How does right. making vineyard designated wines differ from those that are part of a blend, apart from the obvious, you know, we've got multiple components in, in a blend. Right. No, thank you for talking about the, the negociant model. Um, a lot of people are afraid to talk about negociant winemaking, negociant producers, because they think about buying bulk wine and, and making cheap wines out of it. Oh, I but think of Louis Jardot. Jardot. Me too. Like the top houses in Burgundy, that's yeah. what they do. They're Absolutely. Buying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of uh, a lot of negociant producers like that who are Grand Cru and Premier Cru producers in Burgundy. Some of the best wines I ever had were from negociant producers. So they're buying grapes from you know Grand Cru and Premier Cru vineyards and making wine from them rather than owning their own vineyards. And so it's a similar model at Gary Farrell Winery. And um, what's really you know fun and special about making vineyard designated wines, we make the blends as well. But um, I love both. Um, I love the blending process of putting together this Russian River Selection Pinot that you have. Um, but I also love making each of the individual vineyard designated wines because they all have such really tremendously unique characteristics to them. Some of them are dark fruit, you know, the cool climate stuff, um, you know, like Hallberg and McDonald Mountain. They've just got this really beautiful, you know, blue, red and purple fruit qualities to them and bigger, you know, deeper tannins versus in... Um, where Rocchioli and Bacigalupi are located, a little bit more inland in this neighborhood that's called the Middle Reach. It's a warmer climate, acid is there, it's a defining characteristic, but it's not quite as prominent as from those cooler climates. And so it's just fun, you know, to play around with different percentages of, of whole cluster from the cooler climates. Um, you can do a lot more whole cluster inclusion from cool climates than you can in warm climates because um, fruit ripens ahead of the stems. The stems, you know, need a little bit more time. And so in cooler climates, you get more extended hang time. And you can do, I've done as much as 100% whole cluster from Green Valley. So the, the uh, let me um, see if I understand. The what, Is it the stems that ripen before the grapes? The grapes ripen ahead of the stems, especially the in stems. warmer climates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, in warmer climates. But in your area, what's ripening first? Um, well, in... The grapes, the grapes themselves are generally going to ripen ahead of the stems. And okay. so you kind of want, in cooler climates, your fruit is getting an extended hang time. And the more time you have for your fruit to ripen, the greater chance you're going to have of stem lignification or stem ripening as well. Okay. So if you're lucky, you get some ripening of the stems um, where you can use it in the fermentation and get some really beautiful spice characteristics, savory aromas and flavors, black tea. And also you get some tannin in the wine as well from stem inclusion. And um, it, the stems have a lot of potassium, so they also can have a natural deacidification process as well. Oh, really? So it's potassium that deacidifies wine. It, mm -hmm. it must, <laughs> let me not try chemistry, but glom on <laughs> to the wine and drop it out? or Exactly. So okay. it's about potassium and acid molecules interacting with one another, reacting, and, and then it just kind of drops out of okay. the of the fermentation. Okay. You're mercifully untechnical. Thank you. <laughs> I tried. Boy. I tried. <laughs> Without you. writing another dissertation. <laughs> um, so back to the the fact that you've got this negociant model. Are, are there is that a greater risk for you? Like, you know, because you, you don't own the grapes until you purchase them. Like, you don't own the vineyards, is mm -hmm. what I mean. Or is it the fact that, or do you mitigate that because you've got such long-term contracts, it's it all nets out? Yes, the latter. Um, I actually feel like it's beneficial not to own the vineyard because... Um, you know, there's just less risk involved, you know, and huh. we have we have certain parameters listed in our grape contracts that would 
allow us to opt out of the contract if we needed to. Granted, we've never had to, except in 2020 when we mutually agreed with the growers that we weren't going to take the grapes um, because of, you know, smoke exposure. Yeah. But um, it's, you know, if we owned the vineyards, we would be assuming the cost of those grapes if we weren't making wine out of them in years like 2020. Right. Okay. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, you've mentioned that Sonoma has more soil types than all of France, I believe. Um, how many soil types does Sonoma have, roughly, like, approximately? Yeah, gosh, like 31 different soil series. Um, okay. Over It's over 30 different soil series. And, Is there you know, it's between just... a soil series and a soil type? It's the same thing. You know, okay. like Gold Ridge series soil is, you know, it's the, the, the series of the soil type, um, but the type is sandy loam, if that makes okay. sense to you. Okay, yeah. And YOLO so, series um, is more clay-based, a clay type of soil. Huh. And so what happened? Was it some tectonic shift or something glacial? What happened? What created so many soil types in Sonoma? A lot of stuff. Um, there's been a lot of ge geological activity over millions of years, and um, there has been, you know, volcanic activity and, you know, moving of the, the coastal tectonic plates, both of which created the Mayakamas Mountains that are east of us um, between Napa and Sonoma. Um, also flooding um, of the plains and um, the recession of the ocean floor. So. Um, Sonoma County used to be part of the, Russian River Valley used to be part of the ocean floor, kind of a shallow ocean. Green Valley specifically was like a shallow ocean. Okay. Isn't that so crazy to think about? So is there lots of limestone from fossil ocean creatures? Or? There's limestone, not as much as you get in Burgundy. Um, there's a lot of shale, um, sandstone, excuse me. There's a lot of sandstone. And so, you know, Gold Ridge series, um, gravelly or gold ridge series sandy loam soil um has a lot of that in it it's really cool to i've got this uh, this really great image of a soil pit that they dug at the hallberg vineyard um mm -hmm. it's one of our main vineyards it's in green valley so pretty close to the ocean and you know they dug a soil pit down to the root below the root level of the grapevines and adjacent to a row of vines so you could see where the roots are and about 18 inches down it was probably you know between yeah, between 18 and 24 inches down was, you could see the, the Gold Ridge series, fine powdery sandy loam soil on the top. That's called the topsoil. And then down below that is what they call Sebastopol series, which is more of a um, iron rich, kind of orange colored, a um, little bit more clay type of soil. It's clay and sand together. But it's just fascinating to see that. That's also a, a testament to, you know, the vast geological activity that's happened over millions of years. Yeah, I love those kinds of pictures where you see mm -hmm. all the different layers. Mm -hmm. um, now you talk, you also talk about wine neighborhoods. You are getting at that with the middle reach and, mm -hmm. and so on. Each one having a different. I love that your term though, wine neighborhoods, uh, having different microclimates and soil types. Um, so just to go back to that for a minute, the middle reach that would be the warmest one. The middle reach is. Um, now the second warmest. So we've added a, a sixth neighborhood to the, the neighborhood's discussion. Okay. Um, and so the Eastern Hills, um, which are the vineyards that are east of Highway 101. So on the north end of the Russian River Valley and east of Highway 101. So talking Chalk Hill. And um, it's really warm out there. Um, and you don't get much of the fog influence there as well. But the Middle Reach is the northernmost part of the Russian River Valley. Um, a lot of the vineyards run along the river, as I discussed um, when I mentioned Rocchioli and Bacigalupi. I talked about the significance of the fog um, and the type of soil there next to the river. But you also have vineyards that are um, a little bit on slightly higher elevation, and um, you don't get as much of the, the fog influence in those because they're not right next to the river. Um, and those, so you could almost split the middle reach into two. You could talk about the vineyards that are adjacent to the river, and you can talk about the ones that are on a hillside. And the ones on the hillside are, you know, more robust, richer, riper, um, and they have much more of a tannic structure to them. Whereas like Bacigalupi and Rocchioli, the fruit that I work with at Gary Farrell, those wines tend to be more kind of succulent red fruit, lush, soft tannins. Acidity is present, um, but just in the perfect amount, um, not, not as high as Green Valley. So it's, it's a really neat neighborhood to talk about. Yeah, and would you or you you do a little bit of Zinfandel? You said would 
would the Zinfandel be in one of those warmer neighborhoods? So we worked with two Zinfandel vineyards during my time at Gary Farrell, and the one in Dry Creek I already told you about, which is not in Russian River. Um, the other vineyard that we worked with was called Maffei, is called Maffei. It's still there. <laughs> we just don't make it anymore. Um, it's in a neighborhood that's warmer. Yep, it's here, not very far from my house, in a neighborhood that's called the Santa Rosa Plains. And it's called the Plains because it's a, a flatter area. Um, makes a totally different type of Zinfandel than Dry Creek because of the neighborhood. It's a low-lying area, cold air settles at night, vines retain lots of natural acidity, and the, the Zinfandel is not going to be as big and rich and ripe as a Dry Creek Zinfandel. Hmm. That's great. Well, wow. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's just see before I want to get to this tasting, of course. Um, why do you call Chardonnay a survivor beyond the effect of we know that it can adapt to many regions, but what is it about Chardonnay that's a survivor for you? Yeah, um, Chardonnay is just, um, the, they're, they're just really robust clusters and berries. And I find that, you know, with really, you know, big swings in, you know, temperature fluctuations, lots of fog, Pinot Noir is just really susceptible to all kinds of influences. Um, microbial, big drastic weather changes, which I told you about in 2010, for example. Chardonnay is impacted as well, um, but it doesn't really raisin up like Pinot Noir does. Both are thin-skinned, cool climate varietals, but Chardonnay is just really robust and tends to hang on during uh, temperature swings like that. And it's not as susceptible to as many of the microbial issues as Pinot Noir. It is susceptible to things like Botrytis, which is a mold that develops in the vineyard, but when you make Chardonnay, for the most part, most producers are putting the clusters into a, a press and squeezing the juice out and throwing the solids away. And so you don't have, you know, the skins and any damage to the skins to deal with. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, changing track just before we get to the tasting, um, you know, despite some progress, uh, only 14% of lead winemakers in California are women, fewer than 10% of wineries are owned by women. Um, and that is, is the case, not just for California, but many other wine regions. Why do you think the stats haven't changed materially over the last, say, five to 10 years? Yeah, um, I, I just, that's a really tough one to answer. Yeah, I maybe. scratch my head about that all the time. It was about 10% when I got into the wine industry, and if it's only you know 14 or 15% today, that's really a small change over the 22 or 23 years that I've been in the industry. Mm -hmm. So um, why? I can only surmise that um, a lot of women are maybe still deterred by the fact that there are so many men and they think it's, you know, manly work. <laughs> I don't know. Possibly. I don't know. But also I feel like, you know, wineries should make it a little bit more inviting for women. And we try at Gary Farrell. Um, our winemaker, uh, who is in charge of hiring the harvest interns, makes it a point to try, it, try and hire half and half female versus male interns. Oh, he also great. tries to get a really good mix of, you know, people from different parts of, of the world. Excellent. And what yeah. um, what advice do you give to uh, young intern women, men too, um, what advice do you give that yeah. might surprise us? Well, to young women, um, my biggest piece of advice to them is just to be themselves. You know, don't try to be one of the guys, you know, Part of the problem is feeling intimidated by the fact that you're surrounded by so many men and doing this really hard physical work. Mm -hmm. um, women can be as good, if not better, than you know the men at what they do, and so they just need to feel comfortable being themselves and being a woman. Sure, that's good advice. Do you yeah. give any advice to the young male interns, or just like watch out? <laughs> yeah, just you know, <laughs> don't be cocky. Just uh... <laughs> yep, <laughs> yeah. Got it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, you were named Innovator of the Year by the Sonoma County Vintners Association last year, in part for your efforts related to diversity, equality, and inclusion in the wine industry. You were also honored with the North Bay Business Journal's Pride Leadership Award, which recognizes local professionals for their contributions to the Pride movement, including your work at the Human Rights Campaign. How has being a gay woman impacted your own experience in the wine industry? Yeah, I, I think the way it's impacted me most is um, it's taught me how to be an advocate 
okay. know, how to, I, I've been very outspoken since the very beginning, since I first came out. And I came out when I was working at Joseph Phelps Vineyards, uh, probably within a year or around, you know, I had been there for about a year. And since was then, I've just, um, yeah, I mean, my, my brother was gay and he's my only other sibling. And so he came out when I was in early college, uh, when he was in early college as well. We're only about uh, 17 months apart. So he kind of paved the way for me. And um, I've, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, LGBTQ community surrounding me my whole life. And I think I was just prepared for it, but it was hard to figure out how to tell people, um, especially because I had been straight my whole adult life or at least I thought I was. Right. And um, so, you know, I came out to them and once I did, I was like, whew, this is, now it's easy right. yeah. <laughs> doing it, you know, like yeah. ripping off the Band-Aid and doing it. So since yeah. then, um, I've realized that it's, it's a lot easier to just be myself, you know, right. just to be out and proud. And, um, and so I am, and I love it. Good for you, wow. Um, what has changed for the better for the LGBTQ plus community, say in the last five years in the wine industry? Um, the last five years, I haven't seen a huge amount of change. Um, okay. But in the past 10 years, there's been an evolution. Um, I feel like more people are out. Media is writing about the queer community. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you read about it in newspapers and you know, you see videos, postings on social media all the time. And so the more people hear about it and see us, the more they know we're here and that we're significant. And um, it sort of normalizes things a lot more. Absolutely. And what still needs to be done, um, in your opinion? I mean, I think a lot of wineries um, need to just make it feel safe for the LGBTQ community uh, by doing things like using the safe symbol, safe space symbol on your website or putting, okay. you know, signage up on the door, you know, something about equality or putting a safe space symbol out on the front door of your winery as well. Just making us feel safe right. and included. Yeah, that doesn't seem like such a big step. And no. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. And Gary Farrell Winery became an early supporter and member of the LGBTQ uh, Wine Society. Um, which brings together, as I understand, wine lovers, um, wineries, restaurants, hotels, retailers in Sonoma County, and me member Gary Saperstein, who owns Out in the Vineyard, which is such a clever name and organization, mm -hmm. organizes Gay Wine Weekend with exclusive events and special events for the community. Under his leadership, the group has also produced a map of more than 425 wineries in Sonoma that are gay fr friendly, yes, mm -hmm. clapping, yes. Um, is uh, is there anything else that comes to mind in terms of um, inclusion that wineries could focus on? Um, hosting events would be amazing. You know, hosting events during Pride Month um, or or featuring a special Pride wine, like um, Iron Horse has the Rainbow Cuvée, and um, it just makes even though they don't necessarily have a, a, you know, a gay winemaker or, a, you know, LGBTQ plus owner, um, they just support the community. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone is planning a trip to Sonoma, um, what are your best two tips on visiting the region itself? Let's see, what would I say? Um, I mean, you have to eat some of the food. We have some really amazing restaurants here in Sonoma County, but um, if you were going to book a couple of tastings, well, actually, tip number one is don't book too many tastings. Don't try to go to too many places. Sit and enjoy. Book two or three in a day, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually do more than two. Right. And um, I would try to book them in. Choose one that's, you know, a well-known, a big-known winery if that's, weird, if that's your thing. Um, but I would say pick one that's off the beaten path as well and, and really just try to, you know, explore the different off the beaten path areas of Sonoma County. Cool. And what about when they visit Gary Farrell Winery? What are your best tips there to get the most from your, their visit? Yeah. Uh, well, tip number one would be book the last appointment of the day if you can, because you not, you're not going to want to leave. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't want to feel rushed. Um, right. And what else would I say? If the weather is nice enough, I'd say um, sit out on the terrace and enjoy that view that I told you about earlier. Absolutely. And uh, don't assume the woman petting the cat is there to take your coat. <laughs> exactly. 
exactly. <laughs> but I'm okay. I'm also okay when people don't know that it's me. I don't, I'm not the kind of winemaker who has the ego and needs to be recognized all the time. Sometimes I just want to sit out there and just be a regular old, you know, person hanging out on the terrace. I hear you. <laughs> all right, let's taste. I've been waiting to get to this. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. So I'm very fortunate that I have your Russian River Pinot Noir here. Mm -hmm. Do you have it as well there? Uh, no, I have two oh. fun vineyard designated Pinots. Oh, great. Good. Yeah. So we have a, a broader swath to talk about. So maybe yeah. you can, like we've talked about this, it, it's a blend, I assume, of different vineyards from the Russian River, just as yeah. you do one Chardonnay like this. Maybe uh, tell us a bit about this in terms of wh whatever you want to tell us about the background or how it smells and tastes to you as the winemaker, food yeah. pairings, whatever you like. Oh yeah, so um, blending that wine is one of my favorite parts of my job. So uh, it's comprised of about, um, let's say, you know, 25, 24, 23 different vineyards. And wow. um, so it's fun to do the blending sessions when we're putting those wines together because we're sitting down and, and doing blind tastings and figuring out which vineyard designated components are the ones that are the best for the Russian River Selection blend. Now keep in mind that you know if we're we're working with 30 or 40 different vineyards, that's all of our Pinot and Chardonnay. We're working with you know 20 some odd different Pinot vineyards, and um, each of them is a component of the Russian River Selection blend. And so um, you know it's like cooking in in many ways. You know putting something that's darker fruit and and something that's more red fruit that's lush and and soft on the palate, but Another um, component might have really bright acidity and another one might have really big, robust tannins. And it takes a little bit of each one to make the Russian River Selection blend perfect. And that's why it's so much fun to put it together. It's beautiful. <clears throat> I mean, it's just so balanced. It's not too much of anything. And it's a whole lot of, it's definitely your orchestra versus your soloist. <laughs> it is definitely an orchestra. I love the musical analogy. Um, mm. And I didn't notice, which vintage do you have there? Is it 19 or 21? Uh, let me check the label. It is 21. Okay. Yep. And it's just gorgeous. I mean, oh my goodness, everything you were talking about in there. It's like liquid silk as well. So. Yeah, and 21 was a great vintage. Um, it was, you know, a nice, long, extended hang time kind of growing season. And so the, the grapes got to develop lots of, you know, really nice tannins, really resolved tannins. Oh, so it's got wow. great structure and concentration. Yes, this wine has resolved all of its issues. There's nothing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's cool. Needs therapy for. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, so tell us about the two wines you have. So um, the two that I have are, um, can you see this? Okay. Yes, I can. And we'll put a link in the show notes to, okay. to these wines so, as well. This is our um, Hallberg Vineyard Pinot Noir, and this is a 2017 vintage. Okay. And so I was already talking about this vineyard um, when I was talking about the neighborhoods of the Russian River Valley. So this one is located in Green Valley, um, which is incidentally a sub appellation of the Russian River Valley close to the ocean. And so, you know, very foggy. And that Green Valley AVA was established the same year that the Russian River Valley was established in 1983. So, so is it a cooler climate then? Definitely a cooler climate. Um, I find that the Hallberg Pinots tend to have a little bit more blue and purple fruit associated with them and more blue and purple flowers as well. Whereas something like Rocchioli or Bacigalupi would have, you know, more rose petal floral aromas and more like vibrant cherry and raspberry red fruits. Hmm. So Hallberg has a lot of red fruit as well, but I feel like it's really mixed in with a lot of those blue and purple fruits. And would your food pairings differ between the two wines you have there and the one that I have? Yes. Um, the other wine that I have here, actually, I should mention, is our yes. 2017 Sanford and Benedict Vineyard Pinot Noir, which okay. I thought would be fun to talk about because it's in a completely different climate. So we're outside of the Russian River Valley now. This is about five hours away um, south of here in the city of Lompoc. Oh. And it's just south of San Luis Obispo, which is where I went to college. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, in a beautiful area, um, also a very, very cool climate, but totally different soil type, different um, growing conditions as well. So um, the wines are very different from Hallberg, which I told you is a little bit more blue and floral, uh, blue, blue flowers. Sanford and Benedict is more earthy, um, bigger tannins, for sure bigger tannins, and um, a little bit more red fruit forward. So it's fun to evaluate them side by side. Yeah. Food, food pairings wise, 
with your Russian River Selection Pinot, one of my absolute favorite pairings is um, either a banh mi or um, what are the, oh God, what are the Asian sandwiches that are in the, the soft sticky bun? It's kind of, and I'm drawing a blank on that today, but let's just talk about the banh mi, which is a Vietnamese sandwich. Okay. Um, so What's generally it has, generally yeah. it has um, some sort of, you know, sliced meat inside, usually some grilled sliced meat and um, fresh herbs. So usually like mm -hmm. some fresh mint um, and or cilantro and basil. Okay. And um, I often put hoisin in it as well. So okay. it's just really fresh and clean and crisp, but still has, you know, the, the meat usually has some Asian five spice in it. So it's got that, that deliciousness to it. Oh, that would be wonderful. Wow, yeah. making me hungry. It's almost dinner time here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Asian foods pair really well with our wines and with your Russian River Selection Pinot in particular. Absolutely. And would, is there anything else you'd suggest, um, especially with the two that you have there? Yeah. So um, with the Hallberg, um, let's see, what would I have with, I mean, thinking about kind of classic, more Eurocentric food pairings, um, I always love duck with, with the Hallberg Pinot. Um, especially, you know, like a, some sort of a, a blueberry or a black cherry reduction sauce. I think it's just absolutely delicious. Mm. Um, but, you know, Sanford and Benedict, because it has a little bit more red fruit forward qualities to it, I might even pair, you know, some, some sort of Asian dish with it, like a salt and pepper shrimp. Um, mm. Yeah, or something with a bigger, richer sauce to it as well. We did oh, a... Go oh, go ahead. No, no, you, you first. So we did a... Um, a wine dinner at a Chinese restaurant in Miami one year and okay. it just blew my mind that the types of pairings that she could do with these wines with the yeah. Pinots and the Chardonnays because of that beautiful you know mouth-watering acidity and they're not over extracted and they're not over ripe yeah. and they're not over oaked so everything's in balance. This is lovely absolutely and you mentioned the Eurocentric I want to ask you about that why do you think some of those traditional Eurocentric pairings red wine red meat white wine white Need, yeah, are outdated. I mean, you're talking about it. You kind of already answered my question with all of these new spicy Asian pairings and so on. But is there anything more you want to say about that? Absolutely. Um, so just in the 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 name, the Eurocentric um, pairings, um, it's just it it really is very um, insensitive to cultural and socioeconomic differences, right? Um, I kind of try to think about it like an IQ test. Um, okay. you know, IQ tests were made for people of a certain socioeconomic status and, and back and cultural background. That's true. Um, so there are a lot of wine consumers from all different parts of the world. They don't all come from Europe. And so we have to try to turn that flip a switch in our brains to try and think of different descriptors and different food pairings that are more, you know, relevant to people from different cultural backgrounds. I love that. I've never heard anyone describe it like that. Yeah. So, um, and and just the wines as well. Not everybody is drinking Bordeaux and Burgundy every night right. unless you have a trust fund. So that's kind of yeah. Eurocentric thinking too in the actual mm -hmm. wines themselves, you know, especially when you have wines like yours available. Right. In I mean, let's face it, all of our wines um, originated in Europe. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have to give credence to that. Sure. Um, and you also pair your wines, if I understand correctly, at the terrace uh, tasting room with artisanal cheeses. So are there, we do. What che which cheeses do you suggest would go with the Pinots and also with the Chardonnays? Yeah, um, I love, I mean, they have their, their specific cheeses that they put on the cheese plate. I don't remember all of them specifically, but um, with the Chardonnays, um, I like the, um, they, they serve a, Marin French is the producer and the soft cheese is called Petite Breakfast. And um, it's just this really, it doesn't have any, if you've had brie, um, brie can have this kind of gamey animal like quality to it, especially if you're eating the rind. But the Petite Breakfast is just creamy and mild and soft like a brie um, with a little bit more firm texture to it. Um, but it pairs beautifully with the Chardonnays because it, it doesn't dominate any of the Chardonnay flavor characteristics. Oh. Gouda is all like a soft Gouda is also really amazingly like a Conte is really delicious with our Chardonnays. Um, with the Pinot, I would go as far as like a, a really aged 
cheddar or an aged Gouda where you've even got some of the crystally bits in there? Have you had one of those before? Oh, I love those little crunchy bits. That, some of I my favorites. Amino acids or something, are they? Yeah, <laughs> so actually, <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I should really know that. I would think that it's, you know, like salts and um, maybe maybe amino acids as well. I'm going to look into that now. Thank you. There's some little clusters or something. I yeah. It, but yeah, I love them. Yeah. The little crunchy bits. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's even like, you know, like in wine, um, the tartrates are what precipitate out into the bottom um, when you're losing, at, when you're, you know, deacidifying a wine. Um, or when wine naturally deacidifies and ages and tannins and tartrates drop out. Um, I wonder if those are similar to little tartrate crystals. I wonder oh, if it's something wow. like that. Anyway, who knows? It really does all come back to chemistry. Oh, my it goodness. It does. Okay. <laughs> chemistry um, explains everything in the world. Everything. It does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's, uh, I, I love this conversation. Uh, I want to squeeze in a few more questions, but I am cognizant of the time. Um, let's see. Is there, um, is there a favorite childhood food you had? And, and um, what might you pair with it as an adult today? Ooh, what were one of my favorite? Oh gosh, I'm so not a food driven person. Like one of my cats, my young cat. Um, I mean, look, I've always loved chicken. Yep, chicken is good. <laughs> and um, I've always loved the the drippings in the pan. My my wife will make fun of me um, because you know the as soon as we're done with a meal, I'll eat a modest meal and then I'm cleaning up. I'm the cleanup crew. She's the cook and I'm the cleanup crew. So, you know, I'm always going to want to scrape the little bits off the bottom of the pan. And I feel like that in itself could pair with something. That could be a delicious pairing. I um, that drippings. Like, that, yeah. that's where all the flavor is. That's how you season Absolutely. a pan. So that's where the good stuff yeah. is. Yeah. You got little bits of, you know, meat and little bits of the sauce that's left or the seasonings from, from whatever your chicken was cooked in. Oh. So, um, yeah, I would pair that with our Hallberg Pinot since I have it right here. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I should be tasting a little bit of this one. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. What uh, Do you have any useful wine gadgets you've come across that you'd recommend? Oh, yeah. I mean, may I mention a few? Would that be okay? Yes, yes absolutely. Um, so my absolute favorite one um, that I think is a, kind of a life changer for anybody who drinks older wines um, is the Durand wine oh. opener. Have you heard of this? Is it um, the two prongs? Uh, that it has two prongs. Dried out cork, yeah. Yeah, so it has those two prongs. That's an osso. Um, oh. But the Durand has the the worm corkscrew as well. Okay. And so it's a genius device. I don't own one. They're about $150. Um, and I haven't purchased one yet, but I need to. KNL Wines um, in South San Francisco has it for $125 right now. So I think I'm going to grab one. <laughs> but um, it's really a life changer if you're pulling the cork out of an old bottle because, as you know, corks um, age over time and they start to kind of break down. And it can be really hard and impossible to remove an old cork from a bottle. If you have the Durand, you put the corkscrew in first, get it all the way in there, um, snug up against the cork, and then you just put the two prongs of the osso part of it down in it. And then you pull it out like you would using an osso but the corkscrew itself acts as an anchor. So it's a really uh, necessary device for people who drink older, older vintage wines. Yeah, great design. And then another of my favorite things that um, I believe it or not, I very rarely use is this guy. Um, this is a, a, a little bottle closure. It's called Repor. Repor. Um, I really should get some in the house, um, but it's, um, it's intended to use, as you can see, I don't know if you can see here, but there's this little hole in the bottom there. There's a little um, little sachet of some some sort of chemical inside there that acts as a um, oxygen scavenger or kind of a desiccant, so to speak. And so when you get it, it has a little foil cover over the hole, and you just take it off. You can put it in your bottle, you know, screw it in there really good. And if you're not going to drink the wine for a few days, if you leave it closed up, it actually um, pulls oxygen out of the air in the bottle and helps it to age. And, you know, Repor's website also says that it uh, kind of like pulls oxygen out of the wine as well. So um, if you want to read more about chemistry, look at the Repor website because they explain the, the laws of um, the chemical laws behind it. Yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Those are great. And the others yeah. were, I didn't want to cut you off if you had more gadgets you wanted. Oh, to no, that's okay. My <laughs> other favorite gadget is this scary one right here. Oh, a saber. This is right? a saber, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's lethal. It's, it's not really, it's not, 
it's not sharp at all. It's just a, it's an iron horse saber actually. Okay. So I can rub this, you know, it's not sharp at all. It's just intended to use, you use the other side to, right. you know, remove the, the, the top of a champagne bottle when it's, right. it's under so much pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you could share a bottle of wine with anyone in the world, living or dead, who would that be? Um, and yeah. why would you open? What would you ask them? Oh boy. Um, anyone in the world, huh? Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to go with, uh, it's, it's two people. I can't separate them. Um, uh, <laughs> I've always, always, always wanted to sit and break bread with the Obamas. Oh, that'd be fabulous. If I could, I would, I want to sit down and I would, I would drink any bottle of wine with them, but boy, it would be the most amazing thing in the world to, um, drink a wine that I've never had, um, which is a Latash from Romani Conti in Burgundy, Ooh. one of the most historical and, and famous vineyards in, in all of the world. Absolutely. So, and I just want to hear them talk and, and they're so intelligent, both of them. I would love, love to just, you know, hear more from them and just listen, just be the, the fly on the wall. Absolutely. I can't imagine what dinner is like with them just on a regular Tuesday night. <laughs> so much fun, right? I, yeah. I imagine it would be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Um, all right. Um, we have just run the course here. It's just so amazing. And I haven't gotten to everything. Is there anything that we haven't covered, uh, Teresa, that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? No, we've, we've covered a lot. I think yeah. um, your questions are all, you know, digging deep. Uh, this is one of the most, uh, uh, like, deep dive podcasts I've ever done. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you for saying yeah. that. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure. I mean, the stories and tips are just amazing. I, I love the, the, the breadth and depth of your experience. Um, where can people find you and Gary Farrell Wines online? Yeah. So actually, that is something that I, I failed to mention is that um, I, in May, I actually started my own business called Heredia Wine Consulting. Oh. And I am now, I've transitioned full-time out of Gary Farrell Winery, and I'm their consulting winemaker. Okay. So um, Brent McCoy, who's been at Gary Farrell for 19 years and actually worked with Gary Farrell, the man, um, he's now stepped up as head winemaker. And so I'm offering some advice through this harvest, and um, I'm looking and picking up clients myself. So to find me, um, you go to my website, which is www.herwineco.com. Um, it's okay. the first three letters of my last name, and it's just a cool website, Her Wine Co. How cool is that? I that can't believe great. it was available. It worked out. <laughs> yeah, it really did. Yeah. Um, and same on Instagram. It's her underscore wine co. We'll um, put and those links in the show notes as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And um, Gary Farrell Winery, um, go to the, check out the website. You can see some beautiful pictures of the terrace as well, and that's just www.garyfarrellwinery.com. And if you want to go taste there, um, you have to book an appointment. So I'd, I'd suggest booking at least a, a week or two in advance, if not more. Good to know. This yeah. is great. Well, um, Teresa, don't log off just yet, but I okay. will raise my glass to you and say Excellent. thank you so much. I hope next cheers. time we can do this in person. Cheers. Yes, cheers um, to you. Great to, to get to know you and to taste your wines. Uh, amazing. Really amazing. Um, but here's to the next time. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now.